Good morning. Let's see about uh, getting our seventh school going. Hymnals out again. Don't tell anybody. But uh, so we'll do a couple of songs before I get going. So let's turn to number 466 in your hymnals. There. Wonderful Peace, number 466. Far away in the depths of my spirit tonight rolls a melody sweeter than song. In celestial like strains it unceasingly falls for my soul. Before we get into our, the, my, my story today, number 422, Marching to Zion. And I, I hope this first line applies to everybody here. Come we that love the Lord. Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet.
song we're going to be doing is, is 73, if you wanted to keep, keep it out and look at it. And we'll sing that in a little bit, and we'll actually have the, the screen pulled down and on the online, not yet, so that uh, those that are online can see the words too. I didn't have time to do the ones for the song service this morning, so uh, it's good to see everybody out this morning, and uh, it's a beautiful Sabbath day outside, even if it's raining, it's beautiful, but it's not today. It's going to be a wonderful day, so we're glad you're here. The song Holy, Holy, Holy is what I'm going to share a little bit about this morning. Written by Reginald Heber, who was born in Cheshire, England in 1783. And as a young man, he showed an aptitude for, uh, for, for poetry and did well. As a matter of fact, it says he won the Oxford University's Newdigate. I don't know if that's pronounced right or not, Newdigate Prize for the best composition in English verse by an undergraduate by, before he was 20 years old. So he was very well versed and uh, very conversant with English language. And he went on to be a uh, vicar of a village church in Hodnet, Shropshire, in the northwest of England. And this is not far from Liverpool, for anybody that's on it, so it's over on the northwest. And I was trying to see, uh, with people's masks on, met a gentleman uh, that's visiting us from uh, there, Stephen. I was trying to recognize everybody with their masks on, but he's uh, visiting from, the, he's from Liverpool originally, he's a Liverpudlian. And uh, so if you run across him, say, make sure you welcome him to us. So this was not far from there, where he became the vicar of this uh, little village church. And at that time, the Church of England did not use hymns in their worship services. And he thought they should. So he started writing his own hymns. As a matter of, he wrote so many that he had one for each of the weeks of the, uh, the Christian calendar, the, the church calendar. That, in those days, apparently, and I guess in, in some of the different denominations today even, they follow what they call the church calendar so that each week uh, and, and season as you go through had a specific topic that was done at that time. And so he wrote this song. Uh, for what they call Trinity Sunday. I've heard the word, you know, you've got Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland, and all that, but I did not know that Trinity Sunday is the first Sunday after Pentecost. And so on their church calendar, that was the day that was put, uh, set aside to study and talk about the Trinity. So he wrote the song to, uh, to go along with that. But apparently he was not able to... Um, cause the hierarchy of the church to ch change their position on hymns in the church during his lifetime. Uh, even though he went on to become the bishop for the entirety of British India uh, at that time. So he was over the, a large thing, he came, he worked his way up in the church but was not able to do that. It was only after his death that his widow published this wide range of songs he did in a, a work called The Hymns Written and Adapted to the Weekly Church Service of the Year. Whew, that's a mouthful. She, uh, but she, she, so she managed to get this published, and so, like I said, it has songs that went along with each one of the, uh, the different uh, special days on the, the, uh, the calendar there. <clears throat> and I really like this song. Uh, that I say we wrote it to talk about the Trinity, and... Uh, he, that was going to be the focus, and I like. I read some commentaries about it, and so this is one of them. He says, "This song does not initiate praise to the Godhead, but encourages the singer to join in with the endless song." This song has been illustrated by the seraphim singing in Isaiah six verses one through five, "Holy, holy, holy," repeated by the four beasts around the throne in Revelations four two through eight. Here in Heber's song, written in 1826, all the way down to today, we have been encouraged to, to praise God in the form of the Godhead by holy, 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 those words that have been echoed down through the Bible. Um, in the third verse, 
He acknowledges we cannot understand the Trinity fully in the phrases, though darkness hide thee, though the eyes of sinful man thy great glory may not see. He, we will be learning about God through ever and ages, and he acknowledges that in the song. And we are called to praise and uh, the everlasting God. There's a story that was written in a book by Reverend S. Horton. I never did find out what the S stood for. In a book called Say It With Song, and I thought it was something that was very good to remind us uh, that was, it uses this song as part of the, uh, the illustration. So it goes this way. It says, Good morning, Kenton, was the cheery greeting of Lady Lauder, by whom he was employed as a gardener one day. Then she added, You were singing early this morning, Silas. I could hear you as I lay in bed. I hope I didn't disturb your ladyship, he answered. I had forgotten the greenhouses were so near your room. It was thoughtless of me, and I'm sorry indeed. Well, it did wake me up, but I didn't mind. What was it you were singing? The tune was familiar to me. It was an old favorite of mine, replied Silas. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. The musical gardener then made this observation. You see, ma'am, when the world gets busy, there are doubtless thousands upon thousands of singers whose songs are rising like sweet music to the skies. I like to think that most mornings, I am one of the earliest of the Lord's servants offering my tribute of praise. Besides, I always think a few songs before breakfast fill the heart with music all the day. Now, isn't that good words? Thinking about God early in the morning and through song, through our, our study of the scriptures, helps you build on the day as you go through it. So let's turn in the hymnal to 73 there, and we'll sing Holy, Holy, Holy before we separate for our classes this morning. And we'll sing all four verses. Okay. Holy. Lord, this morning we thank you that you are a God worthy of praise, that you get us up each and every morning, that you've brought us to this place 
to your house today that we can spend some time with you in a different way than we do during the week, that we can dedicate ourselves wholly to you and that uh, we can listen to your voice in a mighty way by being with those of like mind because you've promised where two or three are gathered, you will be there. And we thank you for that. We ask that you would be with our classes as we separate, that uh, the teachers will lead their discussion to where you want us to go, that we will learn more about you today than we've ever known before, and we can go forward from this place, and people can say they have been with God. We thank you for your love and for all that you do for us, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to thank everyone for being here. We have our various Sabbath schools uh, here in the sanctuary, in uh, the overflow room, the uh, multi-use room, in Pastor Rovat's office, the library. Um, those that are online, oh, I did want to say something. Happy birthday to Miss Joan Kernow. Her birthday's coming up this next Friday. She'll be 90 years old. I saw that in the, the Happy Friday thing. So I know she watches every, every uh, week, so I wanted to say happy birthday. Uh, God bless you, and enjoy Sabbath. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. And happy birthday to Joan. We miss you, Joan. So, hope to see everybody sometime very soon. How is everyone? For you, I'll say Feliz Sabado. Is that right? All right. Priscilla and her fiancé are here. He is from Argentina. And so if you want to practice your Spanish, no, English with you, right? That's right. OK. All right. Um, OK, so um, what's been going on in everybody's life? Thanksgivings. Yes, Sandra. Um, I have two presents. One is for my mom, her Kichuda. Immunotherapy is working. Her Good. Billy Rubin is significantly better. Good. Significantly less jaundice, doing much better. Um, and also praise for same travels with Justin and Maddie. They were um, moving the last of their items from their Indiana home that they're selling. And uh, yesterday they were almost getting off of I-75 and it started to fishtail and they were swerving all over the highway. Oh, wow. It was quite scary, but um, I just praise God that they made it in safely. And okay. Just, wow. Um, just thankful for blessings. Protection. There. Okay. Very good. Um, Terry Dragon has requested prayer. Um, he's in the hospital and has some medical issues, so we need to keep him in our prayers. Lindy. Yes. I Joe. was reminded by someone considerably older than myself this week. And I was asking her about her trust about the whole COVID thing. And she said, well, I'm smart about it. But she says, I also claim Psalms 91. And it just reminded me 
all of us that are here and that are healthy, how God, how good our God is, and at even I think some points protecting us from the pandemic. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. I am really grateful. I'm glad you brought that up. I'm very grateful for our church, our church family. I think our church has actually done a very good job, and our. Um, Brothers and sisters in this church, I think, have done a very good job being very mindful about uh, all of the public health um, initiatives and so forth and cooperating. And we've protected each other, and I praise God we've been able to worship together. This is uh, one of the few congregations that I know of um, that is meeting and also able to sing and do everything, and, and it's just been a blessing. So um, I am grateful, and I do believe that as we, as we cooperate with all that's, that's common sense, I think we can claim the promises of God and he does bless us. All right. In other words, what I'm saying is that we don't ignore what is common sense, but uh, as we do that, I think God does add a special blessing to all of our efforts. All right, Deb. Yes, yes, you know, my, my twin sister, her church, I see Paulette, um, they have to, they, if they go, they have to, have, they can't say a word to anybody, there's no singing, no talking, you sit there, and as soon as out, they usher you out, you can't even talk in the parking lot, you get in your car and go, and I'm like, that's not church. <laughs> so anyway, it's really nice. Paulette. They mentioned in first service that uh, Forrest Anderson is back in the Forrest Anderson's in the hospital, okay, all right. I did not know that. Okay, so Forrest Anderson, it looks like, is in the hospital, and Terry is in the hospital as well. Anybody else that we know of needs our prayers? All right, well then let's, uh, let's go ahead and, and start with prayer. Father in heaven, um, it is with incredible gratitude that we come to you this morning to worship together to fellowship together in person. What a privilege it is. This church has been blessed for months as we have taken a step of faith with good common sense, heeding the, the guidelines that have been given to us by people who know. You've protected us from harm, and, and so we're grateful. And now we are looking at uh, what appears to be uh, better days ahead. We ask that you continue to be with our church and protect us. Um, we are also mindful that there are some um, that need our prayers. Terry Dragon and Forrest Anderson, both in the hospital. Um, they desperately need your guiding hand for the physicians and, and healthcare providers to do a very good job with them. And so we ask a special blessing for those providers that um, they will be blessed particularly and that uh, both Terry and Forrest will recover. We are also grateful that Sandra's mom uh, Mrs. Jensen is doing well, responding to the treatment that she's getting for her cancer. Um, and also grateful that you protected her, their, the Merriman kids as they uh, are transitioning from Indianapolis to this area. We ask now that uh, you will continue to bless us as we study and open your word, that your Holy Spirit will teach us the things that we need and that your word will be applied to our lives. These texts that we're about to study are rich. And we don't want to miss any of the blessing that you have for us. So be with us now, I pray. And thank you for each member here, each family member here in our church. For Jesus' sake, amen. And those family members are all you guys, so praise the Lord. All right. So um, this is lesson number 11. And it's Waging War. That's the title of the lesson. And I want you to open, we're going to be studying two chapters, and um, chapter 55 and chapter 58. Kazuntai. And um, so the memory text is taken from Isaiah chapter 58, verse 10. So if you're in Isaiah chapter 58, verse 10, uh, let's read that. If you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness and your darkness shall be as the noonday. That's a really important text and we're gonna come back to, the, to that uh, text in a little bit. 
as we uh, near the close of our study. But I just want to emphasize again what the text is saying. It says that if we extend our souls to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted, then your light shall dawn in the darkness. And what I know from that text is that this world is full of darkness. And as we extend our souls to these people in need, light will shine and uh, brighten the darkness. I think that's really important. That's what God has called us to. Um, so, but we want to go back to Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55 is an important chapter um, in the book of Isaiah. And uh, so we're going to study two sections of this. Monday's lesson covered basically verses 1 to 7, and then uh, um, Tuesday's lesson, or say, say Sunday's lesson, and then Monday's lesson was essentially verses 8 and 9. So we're going to do that today in some uh, a little deeper fashion. So I'm going to read a few verses here, then we're going to discuss these verses. Isaiah chapter 55 verses 1 to 3. I'm going to read them and then we'll go back and, and kind of unpack verse 1 a little bit more detail. So ho everyone who thirsts, come to the waters and you, will, you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. What an invitation. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for, for what does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. All right. So these verses... Um, verse 1. Let's look at verse 1. What a bargain. It says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. What in the world is this? Yes. Tom, good to see you. Well, it's a, it's a riddle. Yes. So, you know, what do we what do we pay with? That's kind of the thing. And I, I think going on beyond you know, verse one to verses two and three also. Looking at the start of verse one is the word ho, right? Yeah. It means pay attention. Yes. It's the English expression pay attention. Okay, I like that. So then also in verse let me just say one thing real quick. So for the people who are looking, they like to repeat what's being said. So what Tom is saying is the first word ho is pay attention. All right? And then in verse 3, we have, incline your ear, and then the next line, hear in your social live. So with what do we pay? We pay with our attention. We pay attention. Okay. We get what God has for us. Okay. So he's saying that what do we pay? We pay with our attention. Okay. All right. Good. Anybody else? First of all, who is, this, who is he speaking to in this verse? Isaiah 55 verse 1. Who is he speaking to? Yes. Those who are spiritually hungry and thirsty. Okay, so those who are spiritually hungry and, hungry and thirsty. Okay, very good. All right. Anybody else? Thoughts on that? Yes, Debbie. Maybe that we have some, anyone who believes they have some part in purchasing salvation. Okay, so anyone who believes they have some part in purchasing salvation who he's speaking to. Okay, very good. Yes. Okay. It reminds me of that. The wording of that reminds me of that idea that you know God never had a desire that people would you know just acquire for themselves only, but that they would give back to the body of believers in particular. Okay, so uh, you believe that the what's happening here is that an idea that we are to to assist 
and that no one has any lack or any need. Okay. 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 All right. Okay. All right. Yes. Go ahead, Bob. Uh, I like what it says in the note down here in the middle of the paragraph. It says that it, it needs and desires a, a, actually a transaction needs to take place. Okay. It's like going to the grocery store and uh, and gathering all of your things in the basket. But then you can't get out of the grocery store until you make the transaction and pay for the groceries. Okay. And I think that, that if we think of the word there in that verse, come and buy and eat, if we would say, come, claim and eat. Okay. Uh, we don't claim all, too often the things that we ask for. Okay. If we really ask for something, we are said to believe that we receive it, and that's the transaction that takes place. If okay. you don't believe that you receive it, the oh. transaction has not been complete. Okay. All right. Yes. Joe. I know this is going on long, and I'm sorry, but if we consider the chapters that are bounding 55, obviously you went over 53 last week. We have the covenant of Christ, his sacrifice. But 54 talks about a covenant of peace. That covenant of peace is offered here in the first three verses of 55, in my humble opinion. And he's giving us the actual, here's what needs to happen for you to have the covenant of 54. Okay. Just my humble opinion. Okay. So, so Joe is saying that this first verse is really in context speaking and relating to Isaiah 53 and then 54 about the covenant of peace, and this is what has to happen in order to receive that covenant of peace. Okay, so let's just uh, uh, go with that a little bit. And, and what I want to say is, you know, Jesus Christ himself also used something very similar. Don't have time to go over it, but in John chapter 7, verse 37, he refers to the same thing, come, um, if you who thirst, come to me. And then John chapter 4, when he's speaking the woman at the well, he did the same thing. Um, so the question is, what is this really talking about? First of all, I'm, I'm going to go to what the Quartley says here in a minute, but if we look at this, I think, very carefully, he's asking us to come to the waters. You don't have any money, but he says, come and buy. And then again, yes, come and buy without money and without price. So those are really significant words. Dr. Small, did I miss you? Sorry. You know, in, in doing transactions, <clears throat> When we buy something, um, we're, we're exchanging one, one value for another, or we think we are. When, when Jesus offers that, the, the hard part of this is going into a store and saying, I am broke, I'm hungry, I yes. need something. That is very humiliating. And admitting I don't have anything of value to give to you, uh, is a very, very tough human. Yes. Yes. Human characteristic. Okay. All right. So first of all, as Isaiah is writing, he's writing, remember, primarily to Israel, Judah. And and so that's a significant thing because as we look at this, the lesson points out something very uh, important. And what is being referenced here is the plan of salvation. How are we saved? Are we saved by contributing? Um, or do we go to Christ with nothing, no money and nothing? They gave us three texts to look at, and I just want to look at those very quickly. And the question, I'm just going to, on Sunday's lesson, if you look at Sunday's lessons, page 85, it talks about Isaiah's approach to salvation in the Old Testament compared to, to the New Testament approach to salvation. And uh, they want us to look at three texts, and I want to look at those uh, as quickly as we can, because they're important. And the whole idea is that salvation in the Old Testament is based on the exact same premise that it is in the New Testament. There is no difference. There is no um, New Testament dispensation and Old Testament dispensation. Salvation has always been the same way. 
and it's been perverted by different um, situations, but it's the same way. Where, where was the first gospel preached? Where do we find in scripture the first gospel is preached? Or the gospel is preached first? Genesis 3. Genesis 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Okay, now let me just read. So Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 was the preaching of the gospel. So let me just read what Ellen White says about that very carefully. And the quarterly want us to look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Um, it, first Peter chapter 1, 18, 19, and also Ephesians 2, 8. So first one is Genesis 3, 15. This is what Ellen White says in the book Prophets and Kings. She says this about Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Another note that the gospel was preached in the Old Testament first, from the very beginning in Genesis. The foundation was laid for how salvation would occur. Um, and she says this, When the Savior finally appeared in the likeness of men and began his ministry of grace, Satan could bruise the heel. Remember the text talks about you will bruise his head and he will bruise your heel. Okay? Satan could bruise the heel while by every act of humiliation or suffering of Christ, Christ was bruising the head of his adversary by every act of humiliation and suffering. The anguish that sin had brought was poured into the bosom of the sinless. Yet, while Christ endured the contradiction of sinners against himself, he was paying the debt for, the sin, for sinful man and breaking the bondage in which humanity had been held. Every pang of anguish, every insult, was working out the deliverance for the race. That's what she says, for the race. Who is the race? Human race. It's all mankind, right? So this is an important aspect, and we won't get into it very much, but when Jesus Christ, every pang of anguish, every insult he felt was working out the deliverance of the human race, and that's important. She goes on, when Christ hung in agony upon the cross, while evil spirits rejoiced and evil men reviled, then indeed his heel was bruised by Satan, but that very act was crushing the serpent's head. Through death, he destroyed him that had the power of death, that is the devil. This act, his act of, uh, on the cross, decided the destiny of the rebel and made forever sure the plan of salvation. So the very first place that we see the gospel presented is in the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, I believe what's happening here in Isaiah chapter 55 verse 1 is a presentation of the gospel. Amen. That's what's happening in Isaiah chapter 55 verse 1. So as we read this, we recognize this is the gospel that's being presented. Now the two of the texts they want us to look at is in 1 Peter. So let's look at 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter... Chapter 1. This is a great chapter. And I'm, they want to look at verse 18 and 19, but I want to give a little background. I want to look at the very last phrase in, in verse 2, and then verse 13, and then 18 and 19. So in 1 Peter chapter 1, Paul says, excuse me, Peter says, Grace to you and peace be multiplied. So what does he mean by that? Every time, see, he's just talking, grace to you, like you say hello or hi. This is interesting because that grace is the redeeming love of Jesus Christ. It's the deed, and then the peace with God through redemption. So that's what he's saying right there. Now what he does is he goes ahead from verses 3 to verse 12. He presents the gospel. And then after that, verse 13 says the therefore... That therefore is because of all he's presented already. He says to gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Then down in verse 18. And by the way, I believe that that verse 13 really has a good corollary in verse 2 of Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah 55, we'll come back to that verse 2, but it says... Good up the loins of your mind. What does that mean to good up the loins of your mind? When we say good up the loins of your mind, what are we saying? Guard the avenues of the soul. God, you, you know what you hear, what you partake in, what you eat, all of that. Guard the avenue of your soul. 
exactly right. My parents taught us a whole lot of things, and my, I don't know if I heard that every day. I probably heard it 10 times a day growing up as a kid. Guard the avenues of your soul. That is so important because it means guard what you see, guard what you hear. Everything that you guard the avenues, guard the lines of your mind because you want to pay attention to the grace of Jesus Christ. Now, verse 18 and verse 19, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So um, this is a really important thing because as we begin to appreciate that God could have used silver and gold, he owes all the silver and gold, why didn't he do that? It required the death of Jesus Christ to purchase us. And that's why it was done that way. All right. So um, if you go back now to verse, um, to verse 1, why does he use the word by? If, it is, if salvation, if justification that is given to us as a gift, why are we buying it? Salvation costs Christ everything. It costs Christ everything. It costs us everything. Yes. Yes. So there are two things that we see here. Did you have, sorry, Tom, yes, go ahead. I would say that buying is the choice that you make to get something that you don't have. Okay, so he said buying is a choice you make for something you don't have. Okay, very good. You know, uh, when you, as he uses the word buy, that word begins to emphasize that God offers people, what he offers them to meet their need is valuable. It's valuable. And also, we have to, to give something as well. Now, we didn't read Ephesians chapter uh, 2, verses 4 to 9, in the interest of time. Uh, the quarterly wants to look at that. But that verse, it tells us also that salvation is a gift. It is by the grace of God, not of works, that we should be boasting. So that's an important piece. So again, Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1, is another area in the Old Testament where the gospel is presented identically as it is in the New Testament. That's what this is all about. So then now we can see in verse 2, when it tells us, do not spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what, the, for what does not satisfy. Listen diligently to me, capital M, and eat what is good. What's this verse telling us? Yes, Debbie. You can never have enough of what you don't need. <laughs> that, I, that is well said. Debbie says you can never have enough of what you don't need. That's profound because it's true. The devil will deceive us that we need this or that. We don't need anything. We need nothing. We have everything we need in Jesus Christ. And so the devil will make us think that, you know, you got to go over here, whatnot, but that's not the case. All we need is in Jesus Christ. Yes, Debbie. The P.S. had also defined our worth, our true worth. Okay, also our true worth. Okay, very good. Anybody else comment on that? Yes, Adrian. It's interesting how many people in this universe don't accept a free gift. Yes. It's free. Yes. And yet... We don't accept him. Yeah. And yet the Lord begs us almost to come to me and take it. Yes. It's right here. Yes. How many of us, even us sitting in these views? Absolutely. The, the, the ability to appreciate what Jesus Christ has done for us is really important. And um, when we come to Isaiah 58, we'll begin to see what that actually looks like. Because Jesus Christ came to this well, I love how um, the book Ministry of Healing begins. He, she says that Jesus Christ came to this world as the unwearied servant of man's necessity. It's awesome. And as we begin to, to look at Jesus Christ, we begin to appreciate what it is he's calling us to. So he asked us to please turn your mind away from all this stuff in the world. And then it says in verse 3, incline your ear and come to me here and your soul shall live. These are important. Incline your ear, come to me. Um, here and so forth. So these are important things. Instead of wasting our time that what does not satisfy, we are to, to, to uh, feast on what Jesus has asked us to do. That word buy is two-dimensional. Buy because the gift that Christ has given us, there's no price to it. And he's asking us to give our all to him. 
our attention to him, our affection to him. Yes, Ron. You know, I think we have to think in <clears throat> heavenly terms. Yes. Because in human terms, it just it doesn't make sense. I mean, yeah. I've told my kids, I don't know how many times, um, nothing in this world is free. Yeah. You, know, you, need, you have to work for it. Um, and then if someone is offering you something for free, it's probably a scam. And so that's the mindset we come with. And we have to change it and understand from heaven's perspective what we're really getting. It's like when you get an app on your iPhone, you can say, even though it doesn't cost you anything, it's you purchase it. Yes. You make the decision, that's what you want on your phone. Yes, yes, I like that. You know, as you said that nothing is free, there's a saying, it just came into my mind. And I don't know if I have it all in the right order or not, but sin will take you farther than you want to go, It'll cost you more than you want to pay, and it'll keep you longer than you want to stay. Sin also costs money, and is pretty priceless as well. So anyway, all right, so, so here we are. God is offering us the abundant life. The only thing worth buying is Jesus Christ. It's the gift of salvation. And that buying is in our dedication, our commitment to him, our enter into covenant relationship with him. All right. Now, this is, this is one of my favorite parts. This, uh, let's go to this next section. It's God's thoughts. Now, let me just read um, Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 and 9, and then we'll ask you a question. The, um, and by the way, the quarterly highlighted some things on Sunday's lesson that I thought were very good in terms of Isaiah. Isaiah encapsulates the gospel in the Old Testament and is the same as the gospel in the New Testament. We covered that. There was no old covenant salvation by works ever. Never. Um, to be superseded by a new covenant salvation of grace and so forth. All right, now. So, Isaiah chapter 55 Verses 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So, the author of the lesson asks a question related to this, and essentially the question is, what are God's thoughts? What's he talking about? What are God's thoughts? One of them found in the New Testament is Schwartz. Yes. Is I've come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundant. Okay. All right. Yes. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of peace and not of evil. Okay. I know the you thoughts know I think to you. What a great text. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Praise the Lord. Okay. Very good. Anybody else? Yes, Adrian. I see two hands. Okay. Very, very important to me because I, we've always heard things repeat itself or nothing is new. Over 6,000 years ago, somebody said, I can do it better than you do. I don't think that your thoughts are right today. And it hasn't changed in all of that 6,000 years. Okay. And he's still at it today. Trying to get us to think differently. Okay. And so many times we have that same comment. That was a good comment over here. You know, his thoughts are not out Yes. He wants us to have salvation so bad. I mean, he came down here 2,000 years ago just to get us together. And yet we seem to drift off sometimes. Okay, all right. Don't listen to him. He, he has simple words. A, a, a 12 year old can understand him. But sometimes we just don't, we just don't get that. That's okay. a discussion on thoughts and ways of yes. life. It's something we need to really look into. Okay, Tom. God is dealing with things on the scale of the forest, and a lot of times we don't understand why did this happen to me, God, or whatever. But yes. God is dealing with the interplay of many, many people 
and we're soldiers, and sometimes we don't necessarily understand the specifics, but that's okay because it's not okay. part of our life. Okay, so, so God sees everything, and he knows what's going on, and, and we don't always understand what's happening and why it's happening, but he certainly does. Okay. Yes? All those thoughts are good and applicable, uh, but here specifically, I mean, it says, for my thoughts are higher. So it's a continuation of the thought of the verse before. It says, let him return to the Lord, for he will have mercy yes. on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Yes. For my thoughts are, are not your thoughts. And Praise God. It's all about how God pardons us. We cannot understand it. It's amazing, right? Now, let me just read something Ellen White has said. Um, and um, before I do that, I, I want to read something in First Peter chapter 10, uh, as it relates, to, excuse me, First Peter chapter one. Um, so, so far as man is concerned, our thoughts are always our, about ourselves, what we can get. God is always thinking about what he can give. Isn't that amazing? Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 1. And I just want to look at, a, at one verse in particular, which is verse 12. But I want to build up to that a little bit looking at verse 10. Then I want to read something Ellen White said about these thoughts. And I believe that um, Ron's picking up of the context, he says, for, that goes before, and we speak about the mercy of God. Um, if you look at 1 Peter chapter, chapter 1, verse 10, remember Peter already discussed all this about all this, the salvation, the plan of salvation. Verse 10 said, of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. First of all, the sufferings of Christ produced glories and that is our salvation. But then verse 12 says, to them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have been preaching, who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. This is the line. Things which angels desire to look into. The plan of salvation, I think, is the greatest thought that God has that is way higher than our thoughts. Who would come up with the plan of salvation? Only the Godhead could. I know when I see something going wrong, I have an expression. I say, Lord, smite them with destruction. <laughs> I saw something this week and <laughs> sent it to Debbie. And I said, Lord, what are you doing? Smite them with destruction. But God doesn't think like that. And isn't it a blessing he doesn't think like that? So let me read what she says. And again, uh, if you're thinking about, and I do want you to go back to Isaiah chapter 55, because indeed, as you look at what came before that, this uh, thing here, this, this, uh, the thoughts and so forth, he did describe about seeking the Lord, call upon him, return to him. He's not like you think, uh, he, he will pardon you and so forth. She says this, the science of redemption is the science of all sciences. Do you know she said that? The science of redemption is the science of all sciences. The science that is the study of the angels and of all the intelligences of the unfallen worlds. The science that engages, listen to this. So she's talking about, about the science of redemption. It is the science that engages the attention of our Lord and Savior. That's amazing. The science that enters into the purpose brooded in the minds of the infinite, capital I, kept in silence through times eternal. The science that would be the study of God's redeemed throughout the endless ages. This is the highest study in which it is possible for man to engage. As no other study can, it will quicken the mind and uplift the soul. 
The theme of redemption is one that angels desire to look into. It will be the science and the song of the redeemed throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Can you imagine that? It is, is it not worthy of careful thought and study now? The subject is inexhaustible. The study of the incarnation of Christ, his atoning sacrifice and mediatorial work will employ the mind of the diligent student as long as time shall last. And looking to heaven with its unnumbered years, he will exclaim, great is the mystery of godliness. It's incredible. So the science of salvation is the greatest of all sciences. Comprehending how the God of the universe that spoke everything into existence will humble himself and come down here and tabernacle with us. And Ellen White says that he, Jesus Christ, has joined himself to humanity with cords that will never be broken. That he would do that. His thoughts are not my thoughts. His ways are not my ways. He is altogether different. In fact, he is altogether lovely. Ellen White says that over and over. He's altogether lovely. This is just an amazing thing. All right. Um, any other comments on any of that before we go to Isaiah 58? All right. So where we've been so far is to recognize that Isaiah 55 is a preaching of the gospel. The gospel that shows us that the plan of redemption was always the same from the foundation of the earth. There was no dispensation. It's all the same. We've all been saved, and we have a God that is so gracious, so merciful. His way is always to give, not to get. We want to get. That's how we tend to think. We want to get, but he wants to give. That's all he can think about. The mercies of God, the tender mercies of God, and his incredible grace is what his thoughts are all about towards us. Now, knowing that, and only after knowing that, we go to Isaiah chapter 58. Because if we get to Isaiah 58 without appreciating the gospel, we will be discouraged, right? So I hope that most people are familiar with Isaiah 58 because we don't have time to read the whole thing. And I want you to tell me what this book is, what this chapter is about. So first of all, basically just to, to reiterate a couple of the highlights, the first verse of Isaiah 58 says, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. That's how it starts off. Then it begins to tell about how the people are sitting there and accusing God of not noticing all their works and good things and so forth. And then God says to them, did I ask you to do any of that? Then he begins to describe in verse 6, and I'll read from verse 6 to 8. Is this not the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and that you bring to your house the poor, who are cast out, when you see the naked that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh. Then your light shall break forth like the morning and your healing shall bring forth, break forth speedily and your righteousness shall go before you. What is Isaiah 58 all about? Yes, Lyndall. After presenting the gospel, he invites all that want to follow him to just reflect the attitude that he has. Praise God. Yes. I mean, it's just a reflection of his character. Okay. I like that. So after hearing the gospel, he asks us to reflect his character to the world. I love that. That is great. All right. Anybody else? Thoughts on the chapter as you've read it? Cindy. I like the way the English Standard Version um, has the first part of verse 10. If you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy mm. the desires of the, the afflicted. That speaks to me of not just throwing things at them, you know, like yes. doing, um, you know, giving them money or whatever, but pouring yourself out speaks to having actual compassion yes. and care for them. And yes. you can only do that after you have been filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes. Okay. All right. Anybody else? I appreciate that very much. Anybody else? On Isaiah 58. Okay. You know, verse 1 is an interesting one because verse 1, I believe, first of all, is calling us, reminding us, calling us to repentance and reformation. So in the very first verse, we are asked to turn 
and reform. And then he's asking us indeed what I would refer to as practical godliness. Now, Elwin has something to say about this. I do want to read it to you because it's beautiful. But as we look at Isaiah 58, we begin to appreciate what practical godliness looks like. Um, one, one of the things I'm going to read to you, you're going to be surprised what Ellen White says about this verse. But let me just read that this is from uh, Christ Object Lessons. Christ, the outshining of the Father's glory, came to the world as its light. He came to represent God to men and of him. He went about doing good. He went about doing good. And remember, she said he came to represent God to men. So in other words, what she's saying is that when he went about doing good, he was representing God to men. That's really important. In the synagogue at Nazareth, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he, he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. This was the work he commissioned his disciples to do. Ye are the light of the world, he said. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Then she says this. This is the work which the prophet Isaiah describes when he says... Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out of thy house? When you seize the naked, that you cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh? Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Now this is interesting. She says, thus in the night of spiritual darkness, God's glory is to shine forth through his church in lifting up the boat down and comforting those that mourn. Practical work will have far more effect than mere sermonizing. So that's interesting, right? Practical work will have far more effect than sermonizing. There is nothing that the world needs so much as the manifestation through humanity of the Savior's love. All heaven is waiting for channels through which can be poured the holy oil to be a joy and blessing to human hearts. I like this in particular, this sentence in particular. In them, that's in us, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ has been reflected. So as we go about um, following what God has asked us to do, to represent him to men, to mankind, she says that the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ is being reflected to the world through us. That's a tremendous call, I think, that we have as the people of God. Yes, go ahead. You know, Jesus says, the works that I do, you will do also, and even greater works yeah. than these yes. shall you do. Yes. You know, we were talking about making transactions for ourselves, but in order to be a blessing to other people, it takes purposeful action on our parts to dispense to other people the needs that they have and uh, sometimes that may take money uh, but if we if we spend our money on the poor God says that he will reimburse us you can't out give God it's okay. impossible and he is the, the marketplace or the, or the supply depot his resources are inexhaustible in yes. and as we come to him and ask blessings to give to other people, we can expect that God will answer our prayer. Praise the Lord. Okay, very good. And that's the fruit that we should bear in this world. Yes, all right. Okay, you know, I think, I think yes. Reading through this, he's asking us to do everything, but then he adds one more thing, starting in chapter 13. Verse, verse 13, remember the Sabbath. 
Okay, yes. We didn't have a chance to get to the Sabbath, but the Sabbath is important. And the Sabbath really um, is sort of the capstone of this chapter. Three things I believe that were happening in this uh, chapter. First of all, we are called to repentance and reformation. Then we're called to practical godliness, which is works of love. And then we're called to remember the unique place that the Sabbath has and the symbolism in the Sabbath. So those are really important things. The second bell is one people are coming in. It's what? It's, and a lot of people are missing the blessing that the Sabbath. Now, now I believe that we can do a much better job too of presenting the Sabbath, but, but a lot of people are missing it. Well, let's pray. Father in heaven, first of all, you've given us the precious gift of Jesus Christ, and you've redeemed the race. We have not always been as appreciative as we ought to be. We don't understand the magnitude of your sacrifice. And so we ask now, Lord, that you give us the eyesight that we need, that we'll be able to truly see Jesus Christ for us crucified personally. And then we ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will fill us, that we'll be able to be right reflectors of the character and the mission of Jesus Christ that you've called us to. Thank you for all uh, that you have given us and the privilege of representing you on this earth. Father, may we be faithful for Jesus' sake. Amen.